Okay, so uh, Uli, thank you so much for coming on. It's a pleasure to, to see you. Pleasure to have you on. I know you're a busy man. You've got work. You've got the band. You've got life. Uh, everybody is busy these days, so it is really appreciated that you, you take the time out of your day to, to come on and speak to myself. But uh, how are you doing, first of all? Yeah, not bad, mate. Not bad. It's, uh, it's a pleasure being uh, on the show. Um, we've been trying to, trying to do as many of these as possible um, with various folk over the last while. Um, it's kind of quiet in regards to kind of music right now, so we're just in the in the background trying to work hard and um, yeah, it's 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 a well deserved break. I think we had a very busy summer last year, so it was kind yeah. of. Uh, it was well needed, and um, it's good to kind of have have a few months at work, so I can uh, justify getting off for another few gigs. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. So, um, it's, uh, we're going to go. I'm going to speak to you about all things music. I'm going to pick your brain. You're going to blow my mind with your wisdom and knowledge uh, about everything. But we're going to go right back to the very start, uh, really. So, where are you from originally? Where did you grow up? Um, so I was. Born and brought up in Stornoway on the Isle of Lewis. Um, spent most of my uh, adult years there. I've just recently moved to Inverness. Um, I'm working for a firm out here. Um, one of my pals from Stornoway started, and um, he's growing, growing daily uh, out here. So yeah, I, I kind of island life has been always uh, a thing for me, but. I kind of got to a stage in my life where, um, you know, I, I wanted to kind of spread my wings and, you know, take take my life kind of to the next level. Um, as far as home went, I thought, you know, I've I've kind of seen and done it all. And um, yeah, I think a fresh start in a city was just just came at the right time for me. Um, you know, it's been uh, I I look about forty. I'm only. I'm only 33, um, so it, it's been I kind of had a wild ride through life, um, ups and downs like everybody does. Yeah. But um, yeah, had a tough few years and kind of came back from that and um, had a band and yeah, never really kind of looked back. Yeah. So, see your way back at the very start. So, when you were a child, were you into music from a very young age? Absolutely, yeah. Music was um, a, a big part of my life from an early age. Um, I went to Gaelic medium education um, through primary school, and so we did a lot of kind of folk groups, choir. Um, but f f at the very start, it was guitar I was learning. So I actually learned classical guitar through my primary school years. So. Um, for those that don't know, classical guitar is all to do with finger picking. Um, yeah. It's it's not really it's not chord related or anything like that. So it was I found it very challenging. I got to I think it was grade five, grade six in classical, and it was I mean we were sitting assessments um, in front of just in, in front of people uh, once a year, and um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed it. And the guy that I was, that was actually my tutor was part of a Gaelic band that I grew up listening to. So he was kind of an idol. Um, so it was quite cool. He used to come around to my house and sit in my living room and we used to do 45 minute lessons. So that was really cool. Um, so yeah, growing up, <clears throat> music was, uh, yeah, I would say an integral part um, in in my life. But I, I think it was probably after my, uh, we'll call it teenage spell, um, kind of, paths that people take in life, you know, um, yeah. came out the other side and I kind of started at my local radio station um, when I was 17, just before my 18th birthday actually, um, in 2007, just the end of 2007, 2008 and um, yeah, it really did broaden my horizons because, you know, I grew up, I grew up in the 90s so the biggest thing through then that kind of grew on me was uh, Oasis. It's probably probably a, a big influence on, on what I loved musically. Um, you know, you've got Stone Rose, uh, loads of bands like, um, but there was obviously Runrig at the time. Runrig was a big part of 
Marcel yes. van Boyd, Boydie's kind of influence um, and Wolfstone again Wolfstone mm-hmm. Wolfstone should have probably been a bigger band than they actually were Wolfstone with Duncan Chisholm were an incredible incredible lineup and they were at, really at the forefront of kind of Celtic rock and uh, themselves and Runrig I think Runrig kind of took the baton so to speak and, and ran yep. with it and what Runrig managed to do in their careers was absolutely incredible um, so yeah, these boys, massive, massive influences on my life and yeah. um, forever thankful for that music. So drumming wasn't really in, drumming wasn't really involved in my life until I joined the pipe band when I was probably about 12 or 13, I think, and mm-hmm. started going to lessons, pipe band drumming, doing snare. So I, of course, had a lot of kind of traditional handwork, left and right. Yeah. And, there was loads of rudiments involved in that. There was never, there was never a kit. There was never a drum kit in front of me till I got to college and I studied music, traditional music and sound engineering. So that yeah. was that was kind of um, seventeen years of age. Same same time I was doing the radio that I got into drumming and uh, yeah, uh, I just loved the fact of making a, a big noise. Was it? Um so obviously you, you got you went to college. Was that the first time that you started a band or joined a band? Um, yeah, well, I, I would say it was my first pub band experience when I was eighteen. That was my that was the first time we we kind of did a proper band other than folk bands that were just together for kind of school and you know we do we do an odd Kaylee here and there, but the first proper band I was in, um, I actually did lead vocals and guitar. Um, right. So we had, we had that. We had a drummer, um, Brian McLeod, who's actually now uh, a minister. Um, Rebecca, she used to do backing vocals, keyboard, and we had a um, lead guitarist uh, who was mad for heavy metal. So it was kind of it was Saw Doctor stuff, it's like Saw Doctors, Dire Straits, your CCRs, just the classic kind of eighties, uh, nineties hits, and yeah. you know. What Daniel on lead guitar brought was a very rocky backline, especially with the bass and that kind of lead guitar alongside my rhythm. So it was very kind of, it had a really rocky feel to it. So I really enjoyed it. Um, I then joined a band with Innes, um, who is of course the accordion player in the band. Um, myself and Innes played in a wedding band for about 10 years together. Um, now. We brought something that other bands didn't have in the Western Isles, and that was an accordion. Um, you know, your your pub bands are usually just guitar, bass, and drums, and that's yeah. it. But we had um, a guy who did singing, acoustic guitar, and pipes. So that was a win for every bride and groom because we could bring everything. Other bands used to have to hire an accordionist for the night just for forty-five minutes of Kaylee dancing. But um, yeah. We, we kind of had the 10 years together and then realized, you know, we've done we've done a decade of this and it's weddings began to be uh, not favorable anymore and we've done our fair shares of weddings so we decided that uh, we were just going to kind of part ways and that's, that's, you know, I thought that was it, to be honest with you. I didn't think that anything else would arise. I didn't think I would pick up another set of sticks again. And Looking, yeah. back, looking back now, I'll, I'll bet that you're so the amount of stuff that you learned from playing all those weddings and all those pub gigs that that does you well now. Uh, every situation that you've got to deal with, learning all all different styles of songs, you don't maybe realise it at the time, but it does put you in, in a good footing for for later on. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, any, I think any experience. And it's not just music, anything you do, the more experience you get in doing these things, um, the easier it becomes and the better you become at it. And it's just, yeah. I think... So were, you, were you playing the drums in the wedding band? Yeah, uh, in the wedding band I was I was the kid, drum, the kid drummer. Um, that was the first time really I played kit in a band. That's when I first really started. So if you fast forward... I know Pete and Diesel started around 2018, sort of time just before lockdown, which is probably the worst time for a for a band starting. However, you've managed to do not too bad. But how did obviously yourself and Innes knew each other from playing in the wedding band? 
How did you know Boydie? Or how did you end up in a band with him? Um, <clears throat> well, from my own kind of perspective, I, I knew Boydie pretty well. Um, spent a lot of time at, with us, with himself and pals at his mother's um, sessioning, you know, and uh, yeah, just having having a good time and it would end up in us, you know, four acoustic guitars going at the same time and would have us be playing rhythm and then, you know, Boydie would take the lead and, yeah. you know, it was just like these kind of sessions I, and that's really when the first time I got to hear songs like Country Boy and you know, that was already born, it had already been born, but it just hadn't had, you know, the full, the full of uh, music, musicality, basically. It, it hadn't, like, peaked as Country Boy. So it was kind of interesting when he brought it together, uh, with what, it, what the full sound actually sounds like now. It's totally different to what it actually originally was. But yeah, Boy D, Boy D played a few gigs with Rock Island Line when we were together. We, he came up and did a... Um, a couple of gigs, he would step in if our guitarist was missing or um, right. couldn't play a, play a gig. Boydy would be the man to come in. Um, and it, how it happened basically was Boydy basically messaged in us saying, look, do you want to meet up for a jam and we'll play a couple of pub gigs, you know, and they basically yeah. discussed who, the, who they were going to get in. And um, I got a call out of the blue one night and said, listen, do you want to come up, have a practice? We'll see how we get on. And we'll do a couple of pub gigs and yep. see, where we, see where we go. And... The rest is history, basically. So, I was going to say, Pete and Diesel are, are, are unusual in, in the, the sense that you seem to get quite a lot of, of success pretty much straight away, which is brilliant. But um, obviously, playing all the pubs, playing all the weddings, you start this band, you get a lot of success very quickly. Do you? Is there a point that you remember when you, you realised yourself, I'm successful, I, I, I've... I've made it. Um, I've never kind of, even to this day, I, I, I wouldn't, I, I, I wouldn't use the term I've made it. Um, you know, I think you've got to really keep yourself grounded um, in this industry, especially. I think, yeah. I think as a band, um, because I do a, a lot of the social media stuff, so I'm, I'm very much into looking at insights on these profiles. So I see the growth. Um, where it's going, where the fluctuations are every week. So I'm quite enticed in the figures and the numbers. And um, the, the peak really was kind of the Western Isles video. That The original Western Isles video we made just fooling about on a Saturday afternoon. I mean, that video was made in the space of, I think, six hours. Um, it was just put together. And it, it's mad. Like, you, if anybody followed us for a day on a video shoot, they'd be like, what the hell is going on? They wouldn't have a clue, honestly. And we just make it up on the spot. And I think that is that's the thing about Pete and Diesel. It's not it's not rehearsed. It's not professional. It's it is literally as you see it. And I mean, you never you could never foresee what was to happen for the band. You couldn't. And um, I still don't to this day. Like you you still rub your eyes when you go out to like a Belladrum crowd um, to twenty thousand people. And they're just standing in front of you, and they're absolutely screaming your your songs back at you. That that's the kind of moment you know, like that's the that's the wow. The the headline gig at Heb Kelt Fest, our own festival back home. That, I mean, that's that's something you would never dream would ever happen. And I yeah. think, yeah, if I was to answer, I think these kind of gigs is probably for me. It's it's the, where you just really get goosebumps, and you're like. Look where we are now, you know. What 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 do you think makes the what what do you think makes the band work? And what I mean by that, I don't mean the band being successful, but what makes the band work? As in, do, do you have a lot of bands have like a leader that steer the ship? Do you have that, or and I don't mean that one person is dictating to the rest what happens. Is there someone that steers it, and the, the other two are, are happy to get behind them? Or is it pretty equal across the three of you? Um, well, Innes is probably known as the father figure of the band, so that's probably what you're trying to get at. I think, yeah, Innes is, Innes is probably that guy. Um, Innes deals with so much more than what you see on stage. Innes is financial director, he's a uh, manager, he's, he's just a guy that basically does everything. And, you know, with a job and everything else, I'm, he, he, he literally does have superpowers. 
Um, <laughs> yeah, he is. He, I mean, we all kind of, we all want to do as best as we can. We all want to do all the gigs that we can. And but Innes is, yeah, Innes is definitely um, the follow the leader for sure. Yeah. And when it comes to writing songs for the band, I, I think a lot of people just assume that Boydie writes all the songs, but how do you write as a band? Will, will Boydie come in with an idea, a verse and a chorus, and then as a band, do you use all add your parts to make it better? How, how does it go? Well, it, currently I wish that's how it was happening. Um, yeah, it, 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 he's finding it very difficult. Um, I know everybody out there is kind of waiting for this, this album to to come about, um, but they don't realise how hard it actually is as a songwriter. Boydie's doing, Boydie does 100% of the writing. Boydie is the man that does everything related to lyrics. It's all Boydie. Um, I mean, we might have an input on a word here and there, but it's it's all built up um, through Boydie. After that, um, so yeah, the first thing obviously is the lyrics, the structure. Once he has a structure, he comes to us, so it'll be on WhatsApp, and we'll get um, tons of messages, and he'll go, ah, this is the first take, or this is the second take, and what do you think of this, what do you think of that? And it's kind of a mixture mixture for a while, it'll run it'll run pretty ragged for, I don't know, four or five months, and then Innes will start hearing something in his head, he'll put a tune to it. Um, the last thing to go is probably the drums, um, which, is, which is good. I like... What I like doing is, and I did this for um, Uptown Funk and for Light My Buyer. Um, so everything was built, everything was ready to go. Uptown Funk, we all went into the studio and it was just a counting every time. And I recorded the drums in one night. One, it was one, it was one Monday night. But the drums were done. So I walked away. I walked away the same day I came into the studio, and I was, I was all. Uh, I was all proud of myself. The boys then spent four or five months, maybe, putting their parts on top of it. And, you know, Boydie was wanting kind of the solo, the licks on the guitar. So, you know, when you hear Pete and Diesel, there's a very authentic kind of guitar sound as well. Um, you know, which which Boydie would probably touch on one day if, if you ever manage to find him and get him onto the show. Um, it is very authentic and it takes a long time to get the right sound and he knows if it's if it's if it doesn't sound as he wants it he'll keep recording keep recording and then it'll turn out that before just before it goes to production that he'll go ah oh, you know what i don't like that accordion but how about you change it again so yeah. this will have to come back in again and start recording so it's it's, it's a long process and um like I said about the, about the next album, um, people just have to have a, a wee bit more patience and kind of understanding, I think, is the right word, that it, it doesn't happen overnight and it, it'll take a long time, but it'll be worth it. I think people are probably will be happy to wait, you know, if it means that you get a, a good album at the end of it. It's just as simple as that. But do you, I was going to ask, do you enjoy recording? But you've hardly been in the recording studio that you've recorded that quickly, but... Is, do you enjoy the process of creating something out of nothing or are you very much we need to record in order to play a gig uh, no yeah I'm very much um, if I got a call tomorrow from Keith saying right we've got five songs we need you to come home I'd be on the next plane to Stornoway because I, I love the I love the time I spend with Keith I love the time I spend in the studio um, you know it's a whole different experience and you know, I'll keep getting it wrong for quite a long time and till eventually I get it right. And I know if I go back to Boydie with something that I've just played, he, he might not like it, but that's okay. You know, so uh, again, drumming, <laughs> drumming, the, the guitarist knows. I think, the, I think the guitarist more than anyone or the guy who's writing the tune knows what he wants drum-wise. So, you know, he's got funny ways of telling me what he wants. So he's, you know, he'll go, you know the, do, 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 do. you know the thing you do in the snare on that, you know. Uh, I was like, yeah. So the, he, he likes a lot of build-ups. There's a lot of build-ups. There's a lot of, there's a lot of wee fills here and there, but they're very, I find them, they're very samey, but at the same time they're all different. Um, yeah. But 
you know what I find hard? The hardest thing is Boydie's rhythm on the guitar doesn't really change. It's all it's all chugga da chugga da chugga da chugga da chugga da. So it's it's all it's hard to kind of different differentiate a beat. So you end up having relatively the same beat all the time. And yeah. my parents notice it more than anyone, and they say, "Oh, they're early away to play another gig. You'll be playing the same beat all night." And no, I, but I was going to ask, how important is Keith when it comes to the recording? Because it, there's a lot, there's a lot of times producers and that they're overlooked, but they are always spoken about by the band as being the, the extra member. <laughs> Keith is Keith is um, how do I put it? Um, probably as important as a manager is to a football team. Basically, that is Keith. Keith is Keith is the the twelfth man, so to speak. He is uh, our fourth man and integral, absolutely integral to to the not only the success but you know to everything we do. Keith does a lot more. Um, he has to be babysitter sometimes. We won't say who for. Um, he has to, you know. He does. He does a lot more than just being a sound engineer and producing albums. Um, the guy, the guy works his backside off, and you know what? If anyone deserves success, it's that man. And uh, I can see. I'm. I, I know I'm quite far away from home to sound, um, but I'm seeing he's doing wonderful things at we Studio, and he's got some amazing artists with him, and definitely worth checking them out. Yeah, I mean, he's obviously getting success in his own right, but he's working hard for it, so he deserves absolutely. it. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Question, because you would you would remember this. I, I'm older than yourself. I'm a, unfortunately a decade older than yourself, right? But when I was younger and I was going to a music shop, when you still had music shops that you could go and buy music, there was times where you would go and you'd be looking through the CDs and you could pick an album and buy it having never heard the band before, having never heard any of the songs, you've picked and bought this album simply based on the artwork. And over time, the way that music is now purchased, you get it through streaming, you get it through iTunes. Is artwork still important, in your opinion? Absolutely. You can you know, you know, can tell that by Pete and Deal. <laughs> artwork, artwork's very important. Um, I mean, our design team at Loom, the company we work with are absolutely incredible and the stuff they come up with is next to none and even for the it's not just the albums it's the merch as well everything is just every time they come forward with something it's like wow that's amazing um get it to print basically but yeah i think it's it's very important i think still a lot of people do still buy albums so if you were to go into hmv just now i the one that grabs me about that is um i'm trying to remember the album but the you know the one, uh, the Blink 182 one that had the the black cover with the dots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's the first. That was the first CD I bought in in a music store, and uh, I, I remember that's that's why I bought it because I liked the cover. And then yeah. you know I hadn't really listened to Blink 182, and I, I became a massive fan of Blink 182, and um, you know everything they did, I, I started listening to their music, and that's all because of an album. I think you're you're you've hit the nail on the head if you see a. If you see a nice cover, or a nice album cover, you're you're always going to be lured towards it, and that that's happened with us, you know. Um, I mean, the thing as well, but we're spoiled for choice today because there's access to so much uh, music. But if you don't stand out from the rest, then you kind of get lost. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I have noticed, obviously, that each concert that you do, especially with your t-shirts, you do have. Your, um, I don't want to call it a, the standard T-shirt, but you've got the original. I think it's maybe mm -hmm. the original black one. Yeah. And you you always have one that's specific to that gig, and you know the artwork is different each time. But uh, yeah. I think as I don't know if it was yourself or or Ennis had said, for some reason everybody buys that one black T-shirt. It's just yeah. everybody loves it, and I have to see. I'm guilty of. I've probably got I've got it upstairs somewhere as well. But uh, I don't I don't know what it is, but it just it's a cool looking T-shirt. But yeah, the again, black, the, the black artwork. one is the black one is simple, straightforward, and it is that and the hoodie, the black hoodie, is the yeah. probably the most the most popular item 
to be sold on Pete and Diesel merch history. I think it's very important actually to to bring a piece of merch to a gig. So see, we're obviously doing this Black Isle Belter Festival. Yeah. Um, I think it's very important because it's 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 a piece of clothing or an item that relates to you being at this gig. And yep. year, years down the line, when you pick that shirt out of the bottom of a drawer or the back of the wardrobe and you're like, bloody hell, that was a good day. That was a good night. You know, we had such a good time. And that's, you know, very relative. I mean, I've been to, I've been to a Dolly Parton gig. I come home with a pink cowboy hat. I'm not afraid to say it, you know, but it's all, it's all these, they're all wee momentums and it's, you know, it's always something good to keep, isn't it? It's also that thing nowadays is a lot of times now when you go to concerts, you don't have the ticket stub because it's on your yeah. phone. Yeah. So as yeah. you say, those ones, you wear the t-shirt for a while and then when the t-shirt's finally done, you've still got it. You can't go to the shop and buy it. You probably no. can't even look at your website. You've got to be at the gig in order to buy it. But we're early yeah. on in 24, really. So I assume we've got, you've got a couple of gigs lined up, but... I'm guessing it's recording, it's kind of on the go. Is there any other big plans or is it kind of top secret at the moment? <clears throat> um, I wouldn't say there's really anything top secret. There's, I mean, the Black Isle Belt or the two days with the view and the feeling and the Varsity Boys and all these bands is, is the biggest thing we've done to date. No, undoubtedly, undoubtedly. Yep. Um, there's, we've got room, let's say we've got room for about 10,000. Um, so, you know, it's shaping up to be a fantastic weekend, and that's this is yeah. a, it's a mammoth scale event for any band to kind of take that on is is unheard of, really. So it's 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 going to be an amazing weekend, and you know, so many great musicians joining us. But apart from that, we're we're doing a big festival season again, um, and we're tying in gigs around England um, through these gigs. So we'll be playing like two festivals, and then we'll do three or four gigs around that, just so we can make a week week of travelling away and we could just play these nights so we're not having to come home and then go back again so that's kind of the that's kind of what we're looking at for summer other than that yeah I'm I'm hoping um, I'm trying to keep out of the way of the boys just now so I'm trying to get trying to hope that boy he's in, I heard he was in the studio last week for most of the week so that was very pleasing to me because um, he hadn't been in the studio for a long time he hadn't been home for a long time and it, it was I mean, yeah, I mean, you can get away with playing the same set for so long um, and it, it was kind of getting worried to the stage where, right, okay, this this year could be could be the year, you know, and I mean, when it's all said and done, you know, we at the start said two, two to three is, is decent, but we're, what, well, we're year five, um, it's yeah. still going, so... You know, I'm just going to leave them, let them do what they do, and then I'll get the call from. Ke I said to Keith, "When you're ready, phone me. I'll fly home and I'll get, I'll get it done. Don't worry about that." So I'm looking forward to that call, and I'm hoping it'll be sooner rather than later. It'll happen when it happens, and it'll be, the, it'll be the right time uh, yeah, for everyone involved. But we've been quite serious. Uh, so the last few questions, I'm going to make them a wee bit fun for yourself. Okay. Lighten the mood a little bit, right? So. Obviously, at Pete and Diesel, you're sitting behind the, you're sitting behind the drums. You're playing the drums. You've you started playing the guitar. I've seen you jumping out from behind the drum kit, taking the microphone, doing a wee bit of wagon wheel and bits and pieces like that. Is there another musical musical instrument you wish that you could play? Uh, yeah, the the saxophone. Saxophone. The sax. I absolutely. I absolutely love the saxophone. I think there's probably two, the whistle as well. I love the whistle. Um, if you hear the likes of Ali Levac and uh, the band Project Smoke, or, you know, whistles and trad bands like Scott Wood with Skerry Moore, very, very talented musicians. And I listen to songs and I hear it's very prominent and I would I would say I would love to do that. I did do Chanter and Pipes in school mm -hmm. at, at a younger age, but I'd, I just, my tutor was very, very hard on us. so. I kind of fell out of love with it, but yeah, I would definitely try. I would love to try the sax, and you never know. You never know. It's not too late yet. That's it. Now, imagine you could go back in time, right? Mm -hmm. What's the one concert or gig that you wish that you could have witnessed, that you could have been there? 
Easy. Easy. Net worth. Yeah. <laughs> Net worth. Oh, a uh, hundred times over. Hundred times over. I mean, I watch, I spend a lot of Saturdays sitting there watching, you know, I'm, the thing for me is this whole Liam and Noel thing, it's, you know, it's, it's devastating, absolutely devastating for any fan of the band. Um, but yeah, that gig, man, it gives me absolute goosebumps, absolute goosebumps. Just start to finish, just, they were absolutely, oh, I, yeah. I think it was... I think it was Noel Gallagher that had said that it was, there was, you know, the band, I don't know how long they were on the go for, but the, that concert especially, there was just this moment in time where they were the same age as the audience. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. it, you know, there was just maybe about a year where they hadn't maybe quite hit the, the heights of their success, mm -hmm. but untouchable for that year, they were just oh, yeah. strong. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There's, there's, you know, there's obviously a, f a few of their gigs um, I look back on now. You know, obviously I was probably just too young to be, to be part of that. Um, and there's a few Tea in the Park moments as well. Tea in the Park, obviously, a massive, massive festival. Rock Ness as well. They've had some great acts over the years, and um, yeah, I would have loved to have been at, at any Tea in the Park back in the day and. It just looked a lot of fun. Looked like yeah, I, I wish I was into festivals. It would have been in, and imagine even being, been going back and being in King Tut's the night yeah. that got discovered. Yeah. You know, was it how it's been described over the years, or you know? But mm. you could. I've, had, I've asked the same question to a few different people. Some people, a lot of people, have said Live Aid. They would love to have, have been at Live Aid. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. But then here's another question, kind of in, in a similar vein. Millions of millions of great songs out there. What is the one song that you wish that you could have been in the recording studio to witness it being recorded? Oh wow! Oh, that's 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 a tough question. That is a tough question. Um, or make it three songs if that makes it easier for you. I would have loved to have been. In the studio, <sighs> money for nothing, dire straits. Um, yeah. That is, yeah, iconic, absolutely iconic. Anything, uh, probably Clapton and, uh, well, Floyd, yeah, Pink Floyd, yeah. Um, <sighs> Dark Side. I honestly, I couldn't pick a song off the album. Um, any, I, to sit through, to sit through that album with Floyd and the, just the whole band and the way they recorded the album. But again, definitely maybe with Oasis, what yeah. track do you pick? What track do you pick? You, I physically, physically couldn't pick a track because they're all absolutely phenomenal from start to finish. Yeah. yeah it's and hard. Last question for you, Lee. Uh, Mount Rushmore, who are your four either bands or musicians? Who are the top four for you that whether it be songwriting, whether it be performance, whether it be the overall package, who are the four at the top of your list that they are perfection for yourself? Um, Lennon would have to be up there. Um, drumming wise, drumming wise, Travis, I would say Travis is probably right. Travis is Travis is probably top of my list. Um, Band, wow, yeah, singer songwriters. I, I, again, again, you've got to go down the Pink Floyd route, a hundred percent. Queen, what well, another iconic so, singer songwriters? Yeah, absolutely, definitely up there. But from a trad perspective, from a Scottish perspective, um, for me, bringing my Gaelic culture, my Scottish heritage, Run Rigar. Yeah, Runrig, Runrig are as good a band as anyone, in my opinion, and uh, the songs really kind of spoke to me and have stuck with me through my whole life. And you know, um, songs like Ever Every River and everything, and you know, obviously the sad passing of Bruce Guthrie. These songs, even though the band are no longer a thing, much like Oasis and these bands, their songs will forever live on, and I think they'll they'll carry on. 
I suppose that's the beauty of music is that regardless of what happens, it's, it's always there. Once it's recorded yeah. out there, you always have it regardless of what else happens. But Uli, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. And uh, next time you're in Glasgow, we'll maybe get a wee catch up with that. Oh, absolutely, mate. Absolutely. Thanks very much for having me on. And I, I look forward to everything that's coming out and wish you the best of luck as well. Thanks, pal. Hey, thank you. Cheers, pal. Cheers.